Global India Network. Print, TV, events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com. Welcome back to Brand Business as part of the Global Indian Series podcast, official home for open and liberal conversations. Now, the whole purpose of Brand Business is to plunge directly into people, places and opportunities, really look at the countries that we call home or the countries that are looking to court our global attention. In this episode, I explore the deep questions facing a small landlinked country of Malawi and how the word indigenous could impact the perception and confidence of doing business in a nation where multi-generational global Indian families call home. Today I'm joined by Hitesh Anakat. He's an investor, philanthropist and founder of the African banking group FMB Capital Holdings. We discuss the big ideas that shape the nation, from national identity to the misconceptions of the region. We also look at how the recent controversial legal changes could impact the confidence of local business leaders and what it may truly signal to the international communities. This is a must listen to when trust, confidence and familiarity are essential when considering investing in Malawi. But before then, a quick note from our dear sponsors. If you want to find out more about the Global Indian Series, by the way, well, it couldn't be easier. Simply come to the website, which is www.globalindianseries.com. There you can listen to this podcast and the entire repertoire of discussions so far. Hi, this is Dharma Shingala, co-founder of Novus. At Novus, we believe technology leads the way for a meaningful change. We are on a mission to change the way corporations, governments, and institutions interact with information. Same as the Global Indian Podcast, help people transform for a better future. Find out more on how we are inspiring global change, either at the Global Indian Series website or Novus website to learn more about our innovative software solutions. From our family to yours, I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. My name is Chitra Stern, and I am a proud Global Indian Ambassador and CEO of Martignal Resorts and Martignal Residences. We pride ourselves on the journeys that define a community and our developments bring people together. Did you know that over 70,000 people just like us call Portugal home? The global Indian journey has brought people together in a meaningful way. And on behalf of all of us at Martignal, we want to thank you for joining us in these remarkable conversations. We look forward to seeing you here in Lisbon post COVID. Hi, my name is Divya and I'm co-founder of the Global Indian Podcast. Before you get to today's show, I've got a quick favour to ask. If you've been enjoying our conversations, I'd love if you could take just one minute to leave us a review on the platform that you're listening to us on and share our work to friends and family. It helps us out a lot. Word of mouth is the primary way that we grow. Thanks for your continued support. Hey Tesh, I suppose the first thing is, what's it like to be you? Because you were born in Malawi when you're still under British rule, only a few years ago, mind you, by your youthful looks. But you were born in Malawi at that moment in time. So you've seen these big transitions taking place in the country from colonialism to becoming truly independent to where it's heading now. What's that journey been like for you? It's been in uh, in in two parts, uh, because... I was born in Malawi uh, when it was still a British colony. I was too young to remember anything about it being a colony as such. It was just home. Um, and at the age of 12, I left for boarding school in England. And then I was away because uh, I went to boarding school, then university in England, then business school in America, then worked in America, and then came back when I was 31. So between the age of 12 and 31, I was away, right? Uh, so I've had two parts to it. Um, as a kid, it was just a nice place to live. Uh, you know, knew, knew everybody in the community. Uh, I'm childhood friends from then, uh, still friends today, and so on. Um, and then I came back to Malawi um, in 19, uh, and sorry, in in uh, two, in 1992. And uh, yeah, it's been quite a quite a change in the country, you know, from uh, from basically uh, a dictatorship, for lack of a better word, to multi-party, through various uh, regimes, through ups and downs in business, in the economy, you know, uh, periods of hyperinflation or very high inflation, not hyper, very high inflation, macroeconomic shocks. 
and so on. Well, I suppose the interesting part then is rather than having a look at the economic models of Malawi, Malawi is obviously home to you. It's been home to your businesses, to your family, all the work that you've been doing there. So Malawi evidently means something to you. Would that be correct? Oh, absolutely. This is, uh, my heart is here, my soul is here, this is home. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm Malawian. I may not have a Malawi passport yeah. for, for historical reasons, but I'm Malawian. Do you feel that you mean anything to Malawi? It's difficult to, to say. I would, <clears throat> I'd imagine that uh, to the extent that, uh, that I'm, a, I'm a businessman, I created the first bank, wrote competition, uh, and, and have done my philanthropy and so on, uh, and have a lot of friends here. I suppose I do. <laughs> I mean, it's a hard <laughs> one to answer without being immodest. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so as um, maybe another easy way for me to place it is: what are the biggest misconceptions people have of a country like Malawi? Because when when one has a look across Africa at this moment in time, we heard the stories of places like Uganda, for example, in the past with Idi Amin, and now is obviously repaired with the likes of um, President Museveni coming in, and some of the bigger changes. We've seen this current situation in places like South Africa with people like Julius Malema coming in. And this whole question of national identity comes up. What does it mean to belong? What does it mean to be an African? What does it mean to be somebody who's born in the country, but not necessarily have the same pigmentation that people kind of concern themselves, say, this is what belonging looks like. In your case, what's a big misconception people have over Malawi then when it comes to national identity? Um. I don't know if uh, <clears throat> if we can talk about it as my particular case. I mean, we could. I mean, but I think broadly, your question asks is asking how are Asians viewed, uh, Indians, the people of Indian origin in Malawi, um, and it's mixed. Um, I think the Indians who live here consider themselves Malawian, right? And they very much, uh, this is where they belong. Uh, but what tends to happen is that like everywhere in the world, including England uh, and, and any other part of Africa, different sort of ethnic or racial communities uh, or nationalities almost socialize more amongst themselves uh, so, so there's a distinct like this is <clears throat> this guy is a, an an Indian Malawian or a white Malawian or a Greek Malawian or Italian Malawian or whatever, right? Yeah. So there is definitely a distinct way in which we are perceived, uh, but you know, the people who are more liberal and more open minded would view us as Malawian. People who are more narrow or have any sort of personal uh, agendas could view us as not really Malawians, but living in Malawi and, and perhaps uh, perhaps making the best of Malawi for their self-interest. Yeah. So it's, it's a different perception from different people. Has that changed over time? Or has that always remained a constant? I would say it's broadly constant, uh, broadly constant. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's pretty constant in Malawi's um, case. I, 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 I don't think that necessarily applies to all countries in, in, in Africa, right? Um, I, th I think when, you know, my wife's from Kenya. I go to Kenya a lot. Kenyans view different communities slightly differently. I go to Mozambique. Uh, Mozambique also is is, is very different. Uh, they they don't tend to talk about a black Mozambican or white Mozambican or an Indian Mozambican. Uh, you know, in in in, in communication and normal talk, right? They say he's been here, was born here, he's got a Mozambique passport, he's Mozambican. So it's slightly different here, and I think, yeah, I don't know why, but that that's how it is. <laughs> I see. What about in places like Zimbabwe or Zambia, where you also have business interests? What's the? No, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the, the common thread remains, but it's 
less so in some countries and more so in other countries. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not close enough and I haven't lived there enough to, to pass a fair judgment on, on how yeah. different nationalities are viewed. I mean, I'm, I'm there for a few days at a time all the time. Yeah. But it's different. I mean, Mozambique is distinct because, because it's very evident how they talk about Mozambicans. And and then and and to them, uh, if you if you're from Mozambique, born in Mozambique, been there for a long time, you're Mozambican, which I find interesting. Does, do you find that that's a true sense of belonging? Then do communities find themselves deeply embedded in the culture? I would imagine the more you treated or thought of as as local belonging the more you feel that way subconsciously, right? I would imagine. Yeah, I think it's, it's a fair assessment to make. It's, it's the fact that, like, on your own side, you were born in Malawi. How many generations deep do people of a different nationality initially have to live in a country to be accepted fully to say, hey, you do belong, you are here, you're one of us. I know you mentioned of the good old UK, uh, the blighty weather that we suffer here. But the fact that we have, obviously, the changes that have taken place. When you, when you look back at Malawi, at this incredible history of yours there, what are some of the proudest achievements that you can see, not just as a commercial success, but also things that really change the very fabric of what the nation's standing for? You know, Malawi is, um, has, has grown. Um, what's, 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 what's interesting is, is, is that Malawians are, are very peace-loving and very, very friendly, right? And and uh, anybody who comes to Malawi always remembers how friendly everybody was, how courteous everybody was, uh, and that has remained uh, for years and years and years, and still remains today. So Malawi is is called the warm heart of Africa, and it remains the warm heart of Africa. It's funny, it's you know any um, not any most expats who've lived in Malawi and moved elsewhere. Uh, to England, to South Africa, or wherever, they still have this real affinity to, to Malawi, to Blantyre, to the long way, wherever they were born. And they just automatically connect. I mean, when I go to England, and I'll meet Malawians of all races, and it's this automatic warmth, right? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, so there's something about Malawi. Um, like, you know, in, in England, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends, from different communities, white community, Indian community, Malawian community, they sort of almost cling to the themselves. The Malawians want to hang out with the Malawians and talk about the good old days and how how fantastic the country is, and they they follow Malawi. I mean, I hear about what's happening in Malawi sometimes from my uh, from my Indian friends in England before I find out myself. <laughs> they follow about what's happening in Malawi because they're so concerned. So I, I'd say that's what it is. It's just it's. It, the soul of Malawi hasn't changed, you know. It's a and it's it's a warm heart. Um, economically, we haven't progressed as we should have, uh, as our neighbors uh, have progressed. Partly it's history, partly it's geography, partly it's minerals and so on. Uh, but socially, I think uh, I, th I think Malawi has remained pretty intact. What's as as a businessman? What's your biggest frustration then? When you look at Malawi, when you look at the markets, when you look at the economics behind it, thinking as you rightly said, you feel that it should have progressed a lot further. But what are your frustrations, and what causes your frustrations? Well, every country that has macroeconomic instability, high inflation, currency devaluations all the time, uh, is a problem for investors, right? Uh, so. So we've had macroeconomic uh, instability basically f f for the last 40 years, right, in different forms. I mean, to, to give you an idea, when I landed in Malawi after my uh, living abroad, uh, it was three kwacha to a Malawi dollar, okay? Now it's over a thousand. So we've had to navigate that, right? Uh, so, so that's the that's the issue. That that's one of the major issues, and then the other uh, issue is the issue everybody has with the with with their uh, governments, right? They say they're too bureaucratic. <laughs> uh, 
policies are not right, the policies are not clever, the laws are not right, the incentives are not right, the usual gripe people have, right? Yeah. So we all, we have all of those. Um, uh, but, but you know, I, I, I say that and I complain, then I look back and, and I actually don't think Malawi is that difficult a place to enter to do business and do business, right? It's a, you know, the, you, you get all these surveys about ease of doing business. Yeah. I don't think Malawi is bad uh, in terms of ease of doing business. I think, I think people who are determined to do well in Malawi can succeed. And, uh, and what are the opportunities that you can see for people to come into Malawi for? Because as you rightly said, if you've got high debt, if you've got inflation, if you're land linked rather than landlocked, so you are linked through Mozambique to the other neighboring countries, and you've got access to a lot of lines of credit from the rest of the world, you know, India, for example, is pumping in over 80 billion towards the Africa continent. So it just seems that you got access to cheap financing in a country where you got high debt and access to finance there is even more expensive. It seems like that there should be a big rush of people coming over to the country. That hasn't been the case. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, the, the big rush uh, these days, right, I think almost happens at, uh, virtually happens at, most of it happens at two extremes. One is the very high capital intensive projects, mining and so on, right? Yeah. Uh, the other is very small business people who tend to come, right? Yeah. And then there's some, some guys who come to say do manufacturing and, you know, put in $5 million or $8 million or $10 million and hope to get good returns from those. So because Malawi doesn't have that many mineral wealth, that much mineral wealth, right? We don't tend to get those big investors coming here because, you know, the opportunity is not really there. We do get a, a number of smaller entrepreneurs coming here, whether it's from the Asian subcontinent or whether it's from neighboring countries in Africa, whether it's from, you know, Burundi or wherever, right? And they tend to, to do pretty well as well. Uh, it's that middle, and, and that middle segment, I think, is often driven by the size of the opportunity, right? So if I'm if, if I'm going to be marketing, if I'm going to be making some plastic item or, or or manufacture anything, the question is, what's the domestic demand like, right? Yeah. Uh, and and given our total GDP and disposable income, the domestic demand is limited. So if you're a foreign investor, you have a choice perhaps of going to Malawi or another Southern African country where the country's GDP is five, six, seven times ours, right? So it's difficult to attract them. Hmm. So, so, so what the, you know, governments all over talk about wanting foreign invest, investment, right? Frankly, in, a, in our type of situation, the main investors are going to be local businesses that expand. Right, uh, and 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 often, if 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 local businesses are doing well and they're they're optimistic, they will bring in partners to join them with capital and expertise. Right, uh, so I think that's where we have a better chance to motivate the local business class. Do you feel that the legal structure then in Malawi is conducive to enable local businesses to expand in the way that they wish to and to also provide them the comfort in knowing that they can be there for the long term? Uh, broadly, yes. Uh, broadly, yes. I mean, you know, recently there's been some legislation uh, that has dented some sort of level of confidence Um uh, and uh, but I, I'm I'm hoping that that with experience we will amend that legislation and get back to where we should be. I, I, I like this because we're both skirting around a subject here. You know that I know that you know what we want to what we want to talk about here. But I'm 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 going to leave I'm going to leave the ball in your court for this. But with this denting of the legislation, why do you think that came to pass? What happened in order for somebody to think that's a good idea to enable that to come in? 
Well, there are a number of pieces of legislation uh, in, in in the agricultural sector, in land, and so on. Right, there are few pieces of legislation uh, out there. I think I think it's uh, I think that the root tends to be racial uh, economic equity to some extent. You know, uh, there should be more balance in terms of land holdings, in terms of agricultural land, in terms of people who trade agricultural products, and so on and so on. Right. That's what it. That's the ultimate reasoning. Uh, but you know, quite quite often, what happens is that is that uh, people who've not done business, haven't been businessmen or entrepreneurs, don't sometimes appreciate the implication of the legislation they put in, and 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 it's legislation that can affect how a business can function. But probably more importantly, it's the signaling and the confidence that uh, it takes away if you do it wrong. Yeah, and that's the worry I have. I mean, I I personally, uh, I'm, I'm not particularly affected because uh, I'm I'm you know uh, I'm I'm not in the fields where this legislation has come in uh, to to change. You know, uh, not in areas that are going to be affected by this legislation. But I, I I just worry about the the signaling and the confidence levels because we have to remember that we are a small market, right? Yeah, we are land linked. We're not on a coast. We don't have the mineral wealth, right? So, so we have to do everything we can to be uh, sensitive to what smaller businessmen are motivated by. Hmm. And it and it comes back to that sense of belonging because if you feel more comfortable, even if it's a subconscious level, you have more confidence then to expand further and deeper within the local economy. There, there's one word that's been quite interesting. It's been utilized across Africa. I think it's a rise of the likes of certain characters in South Africa, and that is indigenous African. Now, you were born in Africa. Africa is your home, Malawi is your home. When you hear the word indigenous, does it create segregation between, or at least amongst the Asian community, you think that, do they not class themselves as being indigenous? They were born in the country, they've lived in the country, they pay tax in the country, they have kids in the country. In fact, some people, I think Malawi are now fifth generations deep. What is the implication of that word? Um, I view it... Uh... As a, as a description of, of 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 whether you're black or not black, right? It's, I mean, indigenous normally means you're you're from here forever. Uh, so to me, to me, it's just a way to describe the black Africans to a large extent. Um, look, to the extent that. Um, that the word indigenous is used uh, to sort of exclude others from belonging, obviously it's a negative, or, or feel belong, feel like they belong, right? But to a large extent, it's about how, how secure you feel yourself, right? So I'm not at all insecure about not feeling Malawian. People can people can label me as they want. I know where my heart is, right? I know when I land in in Blanta at our old old airport, right, <laughs> and then and then I go home. Uh, I I this sort of I, I feel peace in peace at peace. You know, uh, it's almost like some stress level has gone down. I'm home, right? So so people can't take that away from me. So they they can label me as they wish to, right? But this is home. So, you know, let, 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 let's take, say, say charity. You know, I, I get, because people think I've got money to waste, I get calls from <laughs> other countries, England, Kenya. Oh, can you do this charity? I said, are you kidding me? I'm Malawian. I'm going to do it in Malawi. You guys do it in your country, right? I mean, I almost laugh them off and say they're being preposterous. Yeah. Why would I, as, as, as a Malawian, who's made his wealth because of Malawi and in Malawi, 
and who belongs here, who identifies with people here, feels for people here, why on earth would I give a penny to any charity in England or or Kenya or wherever or India even? It's a real identity part for you, isn't it? Because you're so Absolutely. proud of being... Well, what is it to be a Malawian? What is that identity then, Hitesh? You know, it's very... You're looking for a crisp answer to what identity is. <laughs> it's very vague. There's no well, crisp did, answer. But, but what I'm looking for is because you obviously did business right the way across Africa. You see the small nuances. Like there's a whole notion of Kenyanness. When you're in Kenya, you can see how Kenyans are. There's something about their personality. If you're in Nigeria, you can see how Nigerians are. There's this um, almost this silent orchestra of movement that surrounds them. Malawi, there is something you can tell that somebody's a Malawian immediately. Even if you walk in the UK, if, if you look at their faces, somehow, especially if they're even if they're South Asian, you can tell immediately that there's something there that makes them a Malawian. And I, I don't know what it is, but I'm asking somebody with evidently better cultural eyes than me. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think Malawians are are. Not, are... Almost naturally warm and friendly, right? Is that is that uh, what it comes down I think to? So. I, th I think that's what I feel because it's still the warm out of Africa. Anybody who comes here feels feels welcome, feels people who are warm to them. Um, so I, I I don't know what to say beyond that. It's very hard for me to describe it. Um, yeah, <laughs> but but evidently it's something that means something on your side. It is, what would you like to leave our audience with? What are your final thoughts about Malawi that you think that the world needs to know? I think Malawi is a place where there's opportunity in, in, in certain areas. And, 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 and I think if, if people come here, <clears throat> uh, they can get very good returns. Um, and, you know, we've had businesses that come here. We've got sort of a number of... Uh, companies from East Africa who've set up here and are all doing very well. You know, we've got companies from Kenya, we've got companies from Tanzania, quite a few companies from Tanzania. And and they've done really well here. Uh, quite often it's in agro-processing. Yeah. Where it's gone well. Um, I think I think Lake Malawi and tourism has potential. Uh, we, need a we need a lot more support in terms of uh, infrastructure from from government and uh, to to sort of uh, push that, um, but I think I, th I think there is opportunity. Like I said, Malawi is not the hardest place to do business by any means. Uh, I, th I think it's a, it's a relatively relatively reasonable place to do business. Now, if you liked this frank, open conversation about Malawianess, well, I think you're going to love our microsite because part of the global indian series as a mooring ground for the world to come together we can be taking a deeper dive into countries perspectives conversations and what you need to know from as an international viewpoint as well as a regional one into these incredible locations and we'll be kickstarting one off with malawi very very soon is your opportunity to learn more about who to trust what you need to know and the government's perspectives are some of the burning questions that you have now if you are lucky enough to be part of our private distribution list, you have an added bonus. If you've got questions around this or you want to touch base about your experiences in Malawi, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'd love to hear from you. I do my best to answer your questions. As always, a massive thank you for joining us on today's show. I look forward to you joining us next week as we continue our 50 Shades of Brown discussions. Until then, stay well. Global India Network. Print, TV, events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com.
Global India Network. Print, TV, events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com.